My name is Brian Trench, and I'm tonight's facilitator, chair, moderator, minder, crowd controller, or whatever it turns out to be. Um, the format here is very simple. I'll introduce each of the speakers briefly. They'll give an opening statement on the topic that they're addressing at this conference in the ESOF tomorrow. Uh, same again for the second person, same again for the third person, and then it's open to you. To those who didn't know that they were coming to a science cafe this evening because they just came to the Kudos bar, uh, well, feel free to join in, or not as the case may be. But if you don't mind, we're going to be shouting at you a little bit uh, over the next hour or so. We actually have to finish in an hour because uh, these are very busy people and they have dinners to go to. And this is an aperitif for their dinners. It's also an aperitif in the sense that if you're a delegate at the conference, you get a little pre-taster of what they'll be talking about tomorrow. So we're delighted to have with us Melissa Anderson, Ellen Hazelcorn, and Pam Ronald. Uh, and that's the order in which we'll take them. And first of all, therefore, uh, Melissa Anderson. Melissa Anderson is from the University of uh, Minnesota. Uh, she's an educationist. Uh, and she has a particular interest in accountability in research, in research integrity, in research ethics. Uh, and she's working on several projects on that. And specifically, and that's what we highlight here, she is the co-chair, along with Sabine Kleinert of uh, the Lancet magazine journal in England, of the Third World Congress on Research Integrity, which will take place in Montreal, Canada, next year, next May. I had the good fortune to be at the First World Congress in September 2007 in Lisbon, and a very interesting event it was too. So she'll be talking tomorrow, as I understand it, about codes of conduct for scientists. So Melissa, what have you got to say about codes of conduct for scientists? Well, I'm privileged to serve as principal investigator of a study on international research collaborations, which shows how important codes of ethics are worldwide. Um, scientists simply don't know about all the problems that they're going to be encountering when they start to collaborate internationally. And institutions are doing a very bad job of preparing their researchers to collaborate internationally. Um, there are problems um, of alignment in rules and laws cross-nationally, um, in the transport of materials, simply getting research materials to the site, the research site can be very problematic, um, getting cash and payments to collaborators in other countries can involve considerable problems and um, unfortunately corruption in some of those research settings is a major problem. I'm going to tell you three stories that illustrate the kinds of problems people have when they choose to collaborate internationally in the scientific world. First a story about policy. This was told to us about a, uh, by a researcher who was working in a, a mid-eastern country and he said that he visited one time his collaborator in the field, um, in the other country. This was a US uh, investigator talking to me. And he said that he went into the office and there was his collaborator signing all of the consent forms using different handwriting for each one. And he said, what are you doing? And the collaborator in the other country said, well, the people here can't read, they can't write, they don't understand the kind of research you're doing. You need to have these forms signed. I'm signing them for you. I, th I think you might need to explain for some people what a consent form is in this case. A consent form is, is a form that must be signed before research with human subjects can proceed. And those forms need to be signed by the subjects themselves according to US law. And that collaborator in that other country was completely disregarding um, the rules and therefore jeopardizing the international collaboration. Now a story about custom. Customs vary, particularly, for instance, the custom around who can be an author on a publication or, or in, in uh, a proposal or any such thing. This is a story that comes from a collaboration between the US and an, and an Asian country. In this particular instance, which was told to me by the US collaborator, um, a proposal was going to be submitted for funding and the proposal was going to be authored by the US person and his collaborator in the other country. But as the, as the uh, proposal was being developed, it appeared that the supervisor of the collaborator in the other country was added to the proposal, even, the super, even though the supervisor had nothing to do with the proposal. So the US collaborator objected. 
And the other person said, well, my supervisor must be on this proposal. And the US collaborator said, absolutely not. And the person said, you don't understand. He must be on the proposal. And the US person said, well, either he goes off the proposal or I go off the proposal. Well, under that kind of pressure, the collaborator in the other country gave in, took the supervisor off the proposal. The proposal went in without the supervisor's name. And that person in the other country was immediately subject to uh, pr uh, proceedings to be fired. So it's, it's U.S. collaborators or collaborators in other parts of the world don't understand what the customs and traditions are that can actually jeopardize the livelihood of their collaborators abroad. Third story um, about grave consequences. This story comes again from an Asian country where the researchers were doing uh, research on AIDS. And they were uh, looking at the prevalence of AIDS in a particular part of the country. And um, they had interviewed many young men who were HIV positive. And they went about their study, completed it. Two years later, they went back to follow up on some of the people who had participated in the study. And they were able to find some of the young men, though many of them had died. But the young men that they found were, in many cases, in prison. And they were in prison because their participation in that study had made it known among their communities that they were HIV positive. And their own families had put them into prison rather than endure the shame of their family member being known as someone with HIV positive status. And so those young men uh, were going to die in prison and that was seen as a better fate than living with HIV. So we simply don't know what we're getting involved in sometimes when we get involved in international collaborations. And institutions have to do a better job of explaining what's involved. Thanks. Melissa, would you just explain the concept of research integrity? Because this is the terminology that's being used more and more uh, in recent times. Research integrity refers to the trustworthiness of the research results. And of course, the trustworthiness of the research results depends on the trustworthiness of the methods and the data and, in fact, the personal integrity of the people involved. So it essentially re refers to the fact that people can trust the work that's coming out of scientific studies. Um, can I tell my own informed consent story? Yes. Um, I've been lucky never to have to go to hospital since I had my tonsils out at the age of three until very recent years I had a small operation. What they call a kind of normal procedure. You know, regular procedure, no problem. I'm under anesthetic and I'm just going under and this piece of paper is put in front of me and said, would you sign this? And being the kind of person I am, I said, no, you better read it out to me. I can't read it. So the poor surgeon had to read out that I consented to it. <laughs> I mean, informed consent in that context, of course, is very well known, but you're talking about informed consent right across the board, wherever human subjects are involved, and they may be just for interview purposes or something similar. That's right. Okay, that's Melissa Anderson's um, stall set out, and we hope that that might lead to some questions. Uh, the next speaker, Ellen Hazelcorn, uh, although born in Chicago, uh, uh, belongs here in Dublin for many, many years. She's uh, Director of Research at the Dublin Institute of Technology and Dean of the Graduate Research School. Uh, and she's been working for quite some time on educational policy and educational research with a particular interest in the way in which universities are ranked according to various tables with which many of you will be no doubt familiar. In particular, the Shanghai one, which is the sort of standard one that people refer to. And she published this book last year on rankings and the effect that they're having on, on higher education. She's been at UNESCO conferences and she's been a consultant to OECD committees and she's been on an EU expert group. She knows all there is to know and all that you didn't care you wanted to know about university rankings. But that's what she's going to be talking about, the relevance of rankings. What does it matter, Ellen, if University X is ranked 226 or 275. It seems to matter an awful lot to those involved in the university. Why? Well, the, there's a couple of things. First of all, the reason it matters is because rankings have become an indicator of reputation for institutions and for countries. It's an indicator of effectively position in the global world order. And increasingly, as the, um, 
as competitiveness increases or accelerates as we try and, and we look increasingly to higher education as the engine of growth, as the engine of, of recovery, whatever sets of arguments you want to use, the importance and the positioning of higher education becomes more and more of an indicator of a nation's capacity to compete and to be successful. Now, should that be? Do they measure what's important? Um, that's a whole other set of issues um, from the question that you asked me. But the fact that it does matter has become a huge impact and a distortionary, what I would argue, a distortionary impact on higher education. I expect what I'm going to say tomorrow really, ha um, there's a couple of issues. One, um, which I'm not going to go into great depth tomorrow, is really about do rankings measure what's important? And my point would be is no, is no that they don't. Um, and that the kinds of indicators that are used are, one could question all kinds of indicators, but they don't actually measure the quality of education. And these are really wide ranging issues around how do we measure and how do we assess quality, but rankings don't measure any of that. So that's the first thing, but that's almost regardless of why they've become so popular, and they're popular because they're simple and they're easy to use, and they are effectively a variation of, um, let's say, if I go internet, if I go to, you've just come from Paris, I go to Paris, I want to know what are the best restaurants I should go to, I go up on the thing, tell me the best restaurants, and up comes a list. So the simplicity of it, and most of them are driven by media companies, with all due respect to your colleagues, and there is a conflict of interest. So, but what I am going to say tomorrow is threefold, really, is that um, the context is clearly very important, but that rankings have been, an EMA, have been a very important game changer. And they have changed the way in which, um, so there is a huge challenge to science, I really want to use the word science to cover all disciplines, <laughs> from the arts all the across to the physical so, um, sciences, so all disciplines. But it has been a huge challenge um, in terms of largely this notion of, um, of um, I increasing uh, comparability and um, comparability of, of not just research and what is research, but also of comparability of national um, competitiveness and so on. So it's a challenge to um, science, it's a challenge to scientists, it's a challenge to nations. And so it has, it's really put it up there. On the other hand, rankings on the, in terms of research, basically attempts to say that some knowledge is more important than others. So it's reintroduced a notion of a hierarchy of knowledge. And I think when we get down to looking at some disciplines are more important, some ways of looking at it, we end up back in a very um, traditional and what I would say elitist debate and discussion that really what matters is only basic research. Because that's essentially what's measured even by the basis of looking at Shanghai, it, it gives particularly added um, um, uh, added points to um, publications in Nature and Science and Nobel Prizes. Well, with all due respect, you know, and we have a lot of them today, but with all due respect, research is broader than that. It ignores the fact that we're also looking at research as a continuum. It ignores a whole range of disciplines, and we can talk about that, but it reintroduces this notion of a hierarchy of knowledge which is actually contrary. And the third thing I'd say is that because of all this, it is driving science policy and driving the reorganization of higher education and research systems, which are really quite, making really quite profound changes in the way in which um, uh, nations are really reorganizing their resources. Is there any rolling back this obsession, I think you call it in, yes. in some places, and if there's no rolling back the rankings, is there, what are the possibilities of reforming the rankings so that they reflect more comprehensively what goes on in universities? I mean, well, I think there's a couple of things. First of all, 
we need to separate out uh, the issue about accountability and transparency from higher education and say that that is inevitable. Globalization makes comparability inevitable, particularly across national jurisdictions and so on. Rankings are one form of comparability. There are, mo there are other ways in which we can measure and we can look at how we assess quality. It could be benchmarking, it could be quality assurance pr processes, um, it could be ratings, even if you want to look at that. There are other methodologies. So, um, first of all, I'd say rankings are one form. There are multiple, there are other forms. Secondly, there are some attempts to look at other forms of rankings. There's a European project out called U-MultiRank. I have big issues with that, but um, there is that project. And clearly, the commercial companies are making all kinds of modifications of their product. Once you come up with that one set of data, you, you, cut and, you slice and dice it in multiple ways for different audiences. It's very clever. Lots of people are looking for data, and it's a big money spinner. You're going to have to tame your right hand. You have to actually hold the microphone steady. Okay, sorry. You, can, you can move the left hand around the place, but just try and hold the right hand. Okay, okay thanks very much, Ellen. Uh, now, moving on to Pam Ronald on uh, something completely different. <laughs> Although I think there's a kind of accountability and ethical stream running through all of this, but we'll see in a sense. Uh, Pam Ronald is a, a plant scientist at the University of California, Davis, with a special interest in rice. Uh, and she uh, and colleagues have developed rice that's resistant to disease and tolerant to flooding, which of course is a major issue in low-lying countries in Asia uh, and Africa. She's received many awards for her scientific endeavors, uh, and she's the co-author of the book that you see uh, the cover of uh, on the slide, which has been very well received. It even has an endorsement from one Bill Gates, presumably in his capacity as a, a huge donor to research on global health issues. Uh, she's received a journalism award as well uh, for something that she wrote for Boston.com, uh, which expresses her, which sets out the challenges as she sees it of meeting the appetite of the world's population without hurting the environment, uh, but combining genetic engineering and organic farming, a combination that we tend to see as actually a collision or even a confrontation, uh, I think, uh, in this country anyway. But uh, she's also written recently on, on whether the tide may be turning in Europe in relation to genetic modification. And she's been in Europe actually just, re just uh, this past week, as was mentioned, addressing a plant genomics conference in France. And she'll be back again later this month, this year, to address meetings and conferences in Sweden, Belgium, France, and Germany. So you'll get to know Europe really, really well. You're very welcome. So what are you going to be saying about the battle to feed the world's population? Thank you, Brian. Thanks you for putting together this, this great event. So we are going to see an increase from the population from the current 7 billion to 10 billion, uh, probably by the time 2050, 9 or 10 billion. That's equivalent to adding the populations of two Chinas to the world, current world population. So one of the greatest issues of our time is how to feed the increasing population without further destroying the environment. And compounding this challenge are the predicted effects of climate change with uh, increased droughts in some area, more heat in some areas, and flooding in other areas. And so we need to use many different tools, approaches, and expertise to address these challenges. And as Brian mentioned, I'm a plant geneticist, and my husband is an organic farmer. He's been an organic farmer for 30 years. And many people feel that somehow plant genetics is the polar opposite of the agricultural industry. Some people think we don't even speak to each other, uh, but we do, and it's not difficult because we have the same goal, which is an ecologically based agricultural system. And so today, tomorrow we'll be talking about some of the subjects that we discuss in, in our book. Uh, which is to try to bring the public to an understanding of what organic farmers actually do, what geneticists do, mm -hmm. and to address questions that come up of what is a sustainable agriculture 
and how to distinguish between fact and fiction on the debate on genetic engineering. Is the domestic combination of an organic farmer and a plant geneticist who favors under certain conditions genetic engineering of, of crops, is, is, is that unusual? Um, I, I mean, as, as a, not just as a couple, I mean, is it, is it unusual for you to be talking to each other at all in, in, the, in the American situation? In, in, in Europe, it would be very, very unusual. It's probably not as unusual as you think because um, many people have gotten into plant genetics because of their interest in the environment and ecologically based agriculture. And I think we love plants and uh, we think a lot about plants. So I don't, I don't think it's that unusual. Davis is somewhat an unusual town. It's a small town. It's in uh, the center of agriculture in California. Actually, we prefer to think of it as the center of agriculture of the world. Uh, in, in our Central Valley, we produce 50% of all the fruits and vegetables and nuts for the entire United States. But it's also a major research institution, and we have more plant scientists there than probably any other institution in the world. So we have, and it's a very progressive, liberal community. Um, so we have, it's full of ideas. People are interested in agriculture. So it's, it's not unusual, it, where we live at least, in an agricultural-based community to have these types of discussions. And we know at least one other couple just like us. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, you've, had, you've heard from the three. Anybody got something on their mind? We've got one person here. We have a roving mic. Judith, would you look after that? Anybody else? Just, just so I so know where you are and I come to find you in a minute. Yeah. And it can be a question to any of, any one or all three, or any two of three, or any four of three. Go on. Uh, hi, I'm... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, my name is uh, Daniel Funerio. I'm the uh, former uh, Romanian Minister of Education, uh, Research, Youth and Sports. And um, I'd like to make uh, a comment to uh, what um, Ellen Hazelcorn has said. Uh, in Romania, we, I, I totally agree. Uh, university ranking is probably one of the dumbest thing you can, to, to put it straight, you can think about. How can you compare a polytechnic school with a medical school? How can you compare an arts university, a university that is on, uh, focused on humanities, with a university that is focused on science? Um, so, at the same time, um, I believe that what's correct to do is university clustering according to various kind of activities they perform. For example, clustering universities with respect to their research activities. So, research intensive universities, uh, teaching universities. Um, what is very useful, especially for governments, in order to consider resource allocation, is study program ranking. So for example, to compare how good is a study program in, um, in chemistry in various universities, but also there you have to be careful and to differentiate between the research and the teaching, because you, you might have some programs which are very good in teaching, but they don't do a great deal of research. So therefore, um, um, it's something that we have to be extremely careful about. And for example, I can tell you the Shanghai ranking uh, is meaningless simply because data cannot be reproduced. Uh, data could not be reproduced. <clears throat> uh, basically, we have asked the raw data to the people that run the Shanghai ranking. Uh, we had a panel of experts that were really trying to reproduce the data. It just, it just can't be reproduced. Um, so I, I, really, I really want to stress that um, um, it would be very, very interesting to go to see um, Ellen's uh, speech tomorrow. I, unfortunately, I won't be able to, and uh, I know that Helen, uh, Ellen was involved in uh, what we did in Romania a bit, um, and I thank you very much for that. But um, this perception must be changed because basically it is not something that reflects reality, and it's up to the community to, uh, um, uh, to do that perception change. Thank you very much. J just before I come to you, do either of you want to speak to that particular topic? Is there anything else on that particular topic? Yeah, good, good. I'm only applying for universities this, there this summer, so and the first thing I actually did was to look at rankings. So and I find it's, like, it's never specific. You just look and you can never find what you're looking for. It never goes deep enough into education or into science research programs or anything like that. So 
it's, I find it very meaningless to just try to dig. It's just, you don't find enough about it. You find more about going to the colleges and actually going to the websites and digging more about news media, about what they've actually done. Ellen, do you want to respond? Um, yes, I thank the, the minister um, with respect to uh, the Romanian. And yes, I was involved in the um, EUA project that this is U European University Association. Um, was involved in a project looking at Romanian higher education and we were looking at um, certain indicators. I think um, the difficulty on a ranking, even as a conceptual model, is that um, it essentially, regardless of whether or not you take um, different types of institutions and you subdivide it, and there are issues around, certainly you're now comparing, as it says, apples with apples and oranges with oranges, the difficulty is, is that you then basically aggregate all the different indicators and they've got some kind of weighting and you end up with a single digit. So it's an ordinal. And as um, the mathematicians will know and in the room, it's that as you move down in the decimals, the differential is actually fairly small. Though it looks like, in answer to Brian's original question, it looks like being 100 is significantly better than being 70 but really, it's not. <laughs> so, you know, people are really not, so as a methodology, it's hugely flawed. The, we could then look at problems around the indicators. It's probably a bit too, too much to say in this environment, but that creates a different set of problems. In regard to then who the audience is and what it's intended for, um, the, and students have always been perceived as a particular audience, as indeed it's increasingly used for governments. But let's say, let's take students as an indicator. It doesn't actually tell you about the quality of the program or what the differences are. Now, there are some attempts. Um, Germany has a system um, of a, what they've called a ranking. It's not really a ranking. Um, Australia is coming up with another system. I saw something in Spain the other day which has more comprehensive types of information about students um, that students would want. More comprehensive information, should I say, about programs. Um, which is essentially, with respect to my American colleagues, it's really putting college guides online in a way in which you can then get some real information. One of the debates then is, should there be a common data set? How do you come up with a common data set? How do you do this internationally? The problems are really quite complex, and um, we are at the early days of that. I mean, I could speak to that, but it's a whole complex set of issues. You, 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 you used a comparison earlier on, which relates to people going to dinner later on, but you talked about exactly. restaurants, exactly. hotels, would be another example. We, we often use these review systems when we're making a decision about going to a restaurant or hotel. We don't think as users of these systems that these are objective measurements. Yes. We accept that these are subjective judgments and we then make our own judgment as to the trustworthiness of the authors by sort of internal evidence. So is that it's a quite different kind of paradigm, isn't it? Uh, yeah, and, it's and a, is there, yeah. I wonder, is there a, an equivalent to the restaurant reviews as there were accumulated restaurant reviews that you could do for universities? Well, I think we're going to move in that. In the first instance, I think the, the issue with respect to um, the rankings, it's the pseudo-scientificness of it. Yeah. And it's the, the ultimately, if you want to use the way in which, let's say, Gramsci or others look at the, the dominance and use of pseudo-scientific um, language, or it's the dominance of, um, of numbers, quantitative, that seems so real. And so uh, politicians and others, and I don't want to really ram politicians on it because the general public and so on is, um, is caught up in this, oh, it must be real. There's some science um, mumbo jumbo behind it. Having said all that, open science repositories will challenge bibliometrics. I think that's good. TripAdvisor and um, Facebook um, Twitter, all these kinds of things will challenge higher education more so because it will ultimately 
you will get, you know, rate my professor. This kind of information will increasingly become a, no a basis by which students and others get information and you then have to ask, well, gosh, how do you deal with that also? So that in itself will pose another set of challenges for institutions and indeed for, for researchers. Melissa, you wanted to come in. Um, you asked whether there's something like a restaurant review for universities and colleges. Um, when I'm not studying scientific integrity, I'm a professor of higher education, so I'm going to weigh in on this one. Um, there are quite a few systems that are based on reputation, that is rankings based on reputation. And there the, the danger is that you can get something that's really off. Every once in a while, there will be a top ranked program in higher education at an institution that does not even have a program in higher education, simply because of the halo effect. That because the institution is very good, we assume that every program in, at that institution is good. If they have higher ed, it must be great. In fact, they don't even have it. Okay, let's move on. You wanted to bring up something else, I think, yeah? Where's the microphone? You, yeah. No, no, we're going to keep it moving around. We're going, yeah. uh, this is for Pam. Um, I'd like to initially thank and congratulate you for your work on the RICE. And I was just wondering if you had any theories that could, um, in the future, help us in the challenge of the famine in North Africa. Yes, so as the questioner said, there are increasing problems um, in North Africa, famines, and there, one of the issues is drought. And there, there are many scientists now working on this problem. And as I understand it, there is a new drought tolerant variety of maize that is going to be released this year. That particular variety was developed with genetic engineering and we'll have to see how that, that performs. But I think um, the concept behind plant genetics, it was, so first I should say there's been an explosion of genetic information. So if you think even 10 years ago, the first plant genome was sequenced, it cost something like uh, $500,000 and it took hundreds of people and it took seven years. And today or next year, it's expected we can sequence that same genome in two to three minutes at a cost of $99. And it's not only the genome of this small model plant, we have genomes of rice, uh, we have genomes of tomato, we have genomes of maize, and not only a single genome, but many genomes from many different varieties. So you can imagine this explosion of information that we can mine genetic diversity as we've never been able to do before. And so there's a big effort in plant genetics to look for those genes that will confer tolerance to environmental stresses such as drought or flooding or uh, confer resistance to diseases that we're not able to control. There's uh, plants get viral infections, bacterial infections, as do humans, and often there's no way to control the diseases. So there is um, a huge effort to develop these new varieties. Anybody else now? Yep, up there. I just want to thank all the speakers. It's such an interesting collection that you've put together tonight. It's great. I guess I have a comment and a question that refers to speakers one and uh, three uh, in combination in a way. Um, my comment is really about the way that Pam started the talk. And I'm fascinated by your sort of combination of your domestic life. But um, starting the talk with we will have X number of people and we must feed them. I always find that really uncomfortable because it, it frames the problem in a very specific way without opening questions about, do we have to have that number of people? Can we talk about population control, which is always very sensitive and very uncomfortable and typically people don't want to talk about it. They want to assume that we're going to have that many people and we have to feed that many people and we have to feed them in the way that we currently feed people, meaning that you have to eat animals and you have to eat wheat and you have to eat, you know, only a handful of crops as opposed to a huge diversity of crops that's available as food and so on. So I think the, the way you frame the problem is, is a little bit uncomfortable to me. Um, 
but, but it's interesting the way you go on. But my question is really, I wonder if you think that a lot of the discomfort that we've had in Europe about genetic engineering has been connected to a lack of research integrity when it comes to, and trustworthiness, when it comes to research on, on the risks or the, the benefits in terms of when we think about questions of what are the environmental impacts, what are the potential health impacts, and you look at the research that's done on that, and there is very, very little independent research. There's a massive lack of transparency. A lot of it is commercial in confidence. A lot of this risk research is done in-house by the companies developing the crops. It's not made public. It's not open for the debate. And there's actually not a lot of it that's well done. So I wonder if, if that lack of research integrity is part of the problem we're having in Europe about genetic engineering. So there, there's a couple questions she brought up. So the first question, um, you make a very good point. Um, we have a growing population. One of the major problems is, is there are so many of us. And another issue is that more and more people are consuming meat, driving cars. Um, there's a huge, huge uh, pressure on our resources. There's many, many different ways um, that we need to work together to, to solve these problems. However, as for the demographics, uh, these projections are based by the World Health Organizations and it's based on the number of children that are alive today. And you cannot really change those demographics unless there's mass starvations or wars. And I think that's something to keep in mind. This question actually comes up quite a bit of, well, we don't need to feed everybody, but I, uh, I think it's a moral imperative that, that we provide a, um, a life worth living and food for the people on this planet now. But that's not to say we don't have to continue to work on controlling population growth. And in fact, it's expected that um, some projections that the population will level off uh, between nine and 10 billion people. But still there is a, a tremendous gap that we face now and there are many ways to address this gap. Certainly, we um, can try to eat less meat, but as you may know, uh, as populations in Asia are becoming more wealthy, they're starting to eat as much meat as you do in Ireland. It's not a simple uh, situation. And we have a lot of food waste in the developed countries. We throw away about 30 to 40 percent of our food after it's grown and prepared and in less developed countries much of that food is lost even before it gets to um, the, the farmer. There are many complex problems but there is no doubt that to achieve a sustainable agriculture we need farmers and we need good farming practices and we need plant varieties. And your second point I think um, you are challenging, uh, the, so the, the plant research community is vast all over the world. It's a hundred year old community. I think there's a lot of concern about commercialization, corporate work, and certainly when you're looking at uh, plant genetic research, any research, and I'm sure others can address that, you need to think about the conflict of interest, perhaps. So if you hear something, where is that information coming from? Is it a peer-reviewed research? Is it from a nonprofit institution? So I, for example, work at a public university. All our work is published. All our work is transparent. Anybody can come to my laboratory. And that's the case of most plant geneticists around the world. Um, there are large corporations that are also developing plant varieties, but they're also developing computers, right? I mean, so you don't throw out a technology just because there are um, business interests that are using that technology. So I think you need to be careful when you talk about research integrity. And there's actually a really good, uh, many good resources now, and I would caution you not to just go on the internet and, and uh, absorb all the information, this is a scientific group, so you know about evidence-based um, interpretations, but I'm, one of my 
graduate students started a blog called biofortified.org. It's not funded by any for-profit groups, and it's not funded by any government groups. It's all academics, all nonprofit, all transparent, and there's a huge list of, of studies that have been carried out on the uh, environmental safety and um, health safety of genetically engineered crops. And every academic organization, nonprofit organizations, organizations of the highest research integrity in the world, including the National Academy of Science, the Royal Society, the European Food Safety Committee, these are groups of um, scientists, environmentalists, and the conclusion from every one of those reports is that the genetically engineered crops currently on the market are safe to eat and safe for the environment. That doesn't mean that every new variety is going to be safe. Anytime you develop a new variety, there is some sort of risk. But I think you need to keep in perspective w where you get your information. And I, I would urge you to look at um, the highest level of academic review rather than um, organizations that might be trying to sell you something, and maybe you can comment on that. Well, I think your, I think your question, am I on here? Yeah, okay. Um, I think your question um, points up the importance of supporting um, institutions that are independent, unbiased, um, not beho um, beholden to any particular corporation. Um, Unfortunately, many universities worldwide are turning to corporate relationships to, to supplement their funding from the government and other sources. And it's very, very important for those academy industry relationships to be characterized by openness and um, a full disclosure, uh, transparency. Um, the academic institutions need to be sure that they don't sign agreements that, that protect uh, findings that are n unfavorable toward the, the funder. Um, they must um, not sign any agreements that uh, keep findings from being published uh, for any undue period of time. So even though there's a movement in the direction to involve um, industry and, and business with academic institutions, there are ways to protect um, the integrity of that work. Um, unfortunately, sometimes trustworthiness is in the eyes of those who, who are perceiving it, and some people will never be convinced that you can put enough controls in place in those situations to keep the, and to maintain the integrity of the research. And, and maybe I should just mention that um, most, almost all scientific journals now, they require a disclosure agreement. So if you're from an academic institution and your work is all nonprofit, um, you don't write anything. If you're funded by a corporation, that has to go on the uh, scientific paper. So that is a way that the scientific community ensures research integrity and transparency. And, and the way science, so science is not an endeavor of opinion makers. Science is um, experimental based, reproducible, and uh, when, when we talk about a high level of scientific consensus, when it reaches the National Academy of Sciences in the United States or the Royal Society or the European Food Safety Commission, when we speak about scientific consensus, that's not the opinions of scientists. That's based on experimental evidence. And uh, those reports are all publicly available. They can be downloaded from the government agencies. So I would urge you to look at uh, those sites of the highest research integrity. And actually in, my, in our book, we have a chapter on who can we trust? Because in writing the book, we realize that the issues not, are not necessarily about the scientific information. There's a lot of issues about, well, who can we trust? And so I think that is a very important question. I expect um, the link then in on that precise on this issue about integrity and who can you trust and is the information valid is equally the point I would make on the rankings issue. Is, um, it's, and we do have a conflict of interest. Um, we have the US News and World Report in, in the US. Um, we have Times Higher, um, which is the other major one. We have QS, which is also run by a company. We have um, the Shanghai, um, okay, it's run by, um, by the university, but they've now spun it off as a business. 
and they're now, in fact, advising all kinds of countries, including, I think, Macedonia had them in, um, trying to set out their, um, assessing their research, um, their higher education institutions. But there is a huge conflict of interest. It's a huge business opportunity in spinning out the rankings and the range of different rankings products that um, are timed to come out with different major conferences or different uh, major events. They've got the, the product differential um, goal so you can get the Asian version, you can get the Latin American version, you can get the this version. There are other companies that are set up about you know, the top um, 100, how to be a top 100. It is an enormous business because it has enormous implications for institutions, for resource allocation, because governments use them as resource allocation, because, quote, smart students use them, because investors use them, and so on. And so, as a consequence, there is a huge um, conflict of interest. And again, we go back to the integrity of the data. Okay, we've still got five to ten more minutes. We've got to let people go to other engagements. Graham here. I was introduced to Graham as Pam's Twitter friend. Um, anyway, Graham's been taking copious notes here, and he's got a really hard question for you, Pam. Oh, maybe not that hard, but uh, I think um, what one of the most interesting things people will find about your book, Pam, is the combination of genetic engineering and organics. And yet, the organic movement generally, certainly in Ireland, as far as I know, would be would, very exclusionary. Is essentially campaigns against genetic engineering, tries to keep Ireland genetic uh, engineering free. And I think you might have a different view on that. So I'd like to ask you, what, what do you think that can genetic engineering offer the organic movement or organic farming? So in the uh, Nas National Organic Program Standards came out, so those are our national um, standards in the United States. They were based on standards that were developed in different states, and California had a very large group called California Certified Organic Farmers, and, and my husband served as president of that organization for a couple years and a farm inspector. And when the rules came out initially, um, genetically engineered seed were included in the National Organic Program Standard, as was sewage, because as many of you may know, it's difficult for farmers um, um, to get enough nitrogen into their crops. So if you can recycle human waste, it really addresses a, a big problem. However, both sewage and genetically engineered crops were um, thrown out in the end. There was a huge protest. I think the USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, received something like 250,000 signatures saying, we don't want genetically engineered crops. So it was removed. Um, and and what, we, what we try to do in the book, we're not trying to change organic farming. I don't think the certified organic system is going to, to change. I think there is a, a strong identity for not having genetically engineered crops. But organically produced food is about, it's less than 1% of the food that we eat um, to feed this planet. So we are really looking at the other 99% uh, of agriculture and trying to consider ways that we can develop um, a sustainable farming. And I think um, there is an overemphasis on how seeds are developed. So all farmers, whether they're an organic farmer or a conventional farmer, use improved seed varieties. So nothing we eat has been collected from the wild. Maybe you have something here in Ireland. I, in, in our Berkeley area, we collect wild mushrooms. Um, you know, we have some really fantastic wild salmon. But other than that, everything is genetically improved in some way. There's a huge continuum of, of how plant genetics has evolved. So for example, one method of developing seeds is to soak them in a mutagenic solution, carcinogenic chemicals, and then grow the plants up and select for uh, plant varieties that have new traits. And none of the mutations are uh, characterized. There's something like 1,500 varieties that are used in that way. Those are all certified organic. And um, so it, it's, it's quite arbitrary to pick a single genetic method and say, well, we're not going to use that. And I think it, it doesn't get at the larger questions, which is, is the food safe to eat? Is it safe for the environment? Are we feeding the poor and malnourished? Are we fostering soil fertility? Are we using um, 
less land and less water, which are very precious resources. Those broader goals is where we believe the emphasis should be. And those are some of the issues that we talk about in our book. Thank you. There's a question over here. My name is Silvia Schreiber. I'm a journalist from Germany and a research communicator in Brussels, by the way, on bioeconomy. So I'm really a bit astonished about the naivete uh, on science of these three ladies we have tonight, because uh, when you're talking about genetic modified crops and you release them in nature, nature will be polluted and it will be polluted organic farming. I have producers in Germany, producers, honey producers, that brand we have genetic free, modified free honey and they are threatened by manipulated crops which come from your labs and which are released. I mean, you cannot uh, contain, once you release a genetic fight, um, modified organism which has a deep manipulated uh, DNA and which is very strange to the nature, you pollute nature. That's not to hinder. I mean, if we weigh the risk and if you say the broader picture of nature preservation, water and environment uh, deserves this uh, manipulation, okay, but then please release this opinion and too and be not so naive towards science. Well, <laughs> just, just, just hold that thought for a while because there could be a lot to be said about all of that. Just, just find... Well, I'm a biochemist. Okay, good, good. We'll, we'll just see, see if anybody else, because we're going to have to just take the last couple of questions or comments. Anybody else behind me? No? No? Okay, well, I'm going to give Pam... Yes, there is somebody. We just take one more, and then, then we give you each a chance, and you can pick that one up in your last words. Yes, please. Um, hey, I'm Christian. Um, I study medicine, but I also have a background in biotechnology. Um, and I actually find that quite interesting because I'm more worried about the sewage. I mean, the whole hormones and the antibiotics that we produce that we should then put in our soil. Um, but let's get back to the GMO. I enjoy that you're dedicated to trying to solve this problem, uh, and especially the world world, and it's a very multifaceted problem, and there are many approaches to the solution. And therefore, this really just illustrates a scientist that is passionate about solving things. And I enjoyed that. And yes, there are many problems about this. But my worry is more about the industry, the agricultural industry and the seed producers that in some way sort of create a feudalist um, uh, chain uh, that captures the, 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 uh, the, uh, the farmers because they're dependent on buying the seed. And in that way, there will be large corporations like Monsanto who then control what we can produce. So we, we have very dedicated researchers who want to create new strains, but they might not actually be accessible to the farmer. That's where my concern is. Okay, I'm gonna, Pam, I, I know you have to go, and I know just yeah, respect, but, right. but with respect to those, just maybe address those. Oh, you have to go. And then Ellen and Melissa, if you've got a last comment to be, we take them then. So please, Pam. Okay, so you bring up a, a good question. So something like, Five companies control most of the seed produced in the world now. It's become, um, at UC Davis, we used to have a very strong uh, public program for plant breeding. Most of that has been moved to industry. And uh, as researchers in the nonprofit domain, we want to see more uh, research funding for the public good. But still, it's not so simple as saying, I don't like large corporations, so I'm not going to buy their seed, because uh, these large companies, they're using every t genetic method. They're using um, uh, hybridization. So this concern about farmers not being able to grow the seed and self it and plant it again, that's actually because of hybridization, which was developed in the 1940s. And it's an approach that uh, all farmers in the developed world um, often use hybrid seeds when they're available, including organic farmers. And they're not able to replant their seed because it's the, the process of genetics. Uh, the reason the farmers buy those seed is because they're very, um, you know, high yielding and resistant to disease. Um, and so again, it's not, I think you're right. We need to be concerned. We don't want a few companies controlling the world seed supply. We need to foster small companies, nonprofit organizations. But again, they, the companies, they probably want to own 
all the seed. They don't care if it's developed through genetic engineering or another method. So you, you bring up a very important question, uh, but the answer is not so simple. And I think it's a it's not an answer of science. It's an it's uh, it needs to be addressed by example by the Department of Justice uh, to prevent monopolies. So it's a it's not a science question, but it's an important question. Okay, I think we need to close it uh, very quickly. Alan, have you anything that's burning you? Well, I was only going to refer to, the, to this discussion, and it's completely probably unscientific, and it's um, from a different point of view. It has to do with fish, and, um, and it's only personal observation. I was in Australia for a while on a sabbatical, and I'd go into, if anyone knows anyone from Australia, from Melbourne, fish markets are just fantastic. I mean, the piles of prawns are just enormous. And I think, my gosh, they must have cleaned out the entire um, ocean to get these piles of prawns that are there every, every week in the market. Then I realized, of course, that they're farmed. And increasingly, obviously, in this country, we have um, farm salmon. There's very little wild salmon left. We have farm sea trout and so on. And I have a big issue about whether or not I'm going to, this is not, I really wanted, and then I began to think, well, we farm cows, why are we not farming fish? And we look increasingly, and to some extent, this comes back to Pam's question about how do we deal with an issue about feeding the existing population, let alone growing, uh, providing sufficient food for a growing population. And I think it is, um, it's a lot about um, public information, a wider discussion, a, a broader understanding. But it's certainly, I'm a big fish eater, but certainly the idea that we're going to live off wild fish is not going to happen. Melissa, you can address any question of fish, rice, Sorry? meat, or anything you like. The most prominent outcome of the second World Conference on Research Integrity was the Singapore Statement. And when that Singapore statement was being drafted, it was pretty clear that people thought that things like fabrication, falsification, plagiarism are bad things. But when it came to addressing the social consequences of research, which is really has taken up much of our discussion here, it was clear that that was a, a matter of very different nature from understanding research integrity in that narrow sense. It was so problematic that the all that we could come up with uh, in that Singapore statement as a matter of world uh, global uh, consensus was that researchers should consider the consequences of their research for the social good. And in fact, we're going to have to take that up at the third world conference because it's such a, a critical matter for people to address and come to some kind of agreement on. It's not an easy issue, as you could tell by this discussion. Right, I'm going to give each of our speakers a, a little token of our gratitude. Um, and as I do it, you can show your gratitude as well. But the book uh, that I'm going to give you is written by Mary Mulvihill, who is actually very busy taking people around Dublin on walking tours of scientific interest. It's called Ingenious Ireland. Mary is a member of the Irish Science and Technology Journalists Association. But please put your hands together for Ellen Hazelcorn, Pam Ronald, and Melissa. Thank you.